This episode is proudly supported by Open Table. Nearly one third of diners are booking same day. So they're making those decisions on the spot. And 10% are, do- are making their bookings within just a few hours. And so it's why it's so important to have you know, booking software like Open Table, which allows your diners to discover you. And so when restaurants are on platforms like Open Table, they're much more likely to be discovered. We help diners to connect to restaurants. Ultimately, having technology, using technology, helps you to reattach to those diners. Experience the power of Open Table. For an exclusive offer, visit restaurant.opentable.com.au forward slash DITW. Being able to interact with the customers is what I'm really looking forward to. Um, and being able to to talk to people and just be like, this is how I'm doing this and it's delicious, you should eat some. <laughs> It'll go well with that, you know. And um, I just really like having the connection to the customers and, and to my to the people I work with. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The disruptive nature of the last year and a half has meant many in the industry have tried their hand at other vocations to ensure money comes through the door until they can re-emerge in the hospitality sector. As the industry and society opens up again, there are also many opportunities for those to embark on a new journey in food, open their own venues, and take a chance on an idea too. Gemma Whiteman is the head chef and co-owner of soon to be open, Auntie. Gemma, how are you? Good, thank you. How, how are you? I'm good. You've done so many things, very left field things in, in food, and you're about to open a new venue. How does it feel doing that given the last year and a half? <laughs> uh, it's pretty crazy. The Auntie, auntie that we're opening, uh, by the time we open, will have been in the works. We signed the lease a year ago. Uh, yeah, like next week. <laughs> It's been crazy. <laughs> What's been some of the challenges and hurdles in, in getting it getting it up and running um, apart from sort of the lockdowns? Um, we've been pretty lucky. We haven't been super affected by lockdown per se, but, um, I mean, how long have you got? It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's um, we've had a lot of council, um, just forms to fill in and time to wait and, it's just an endless cycle of uh, forms and money. <laughs> it's been in the works for a year now. Tell us about the uh, conception. When when did the idea um, come to fruition and what is Anti about? Um, so this is something um, we've talked about for a couple of years now. It's all, I know it's always been a dream of uh, Matt's, who is uh, my business partner. He owns... Uh, black market sake and he's been importing sake into Australia for 11 years now Um, and we'd always kind of had this pipe dream but uh, we took a really big trip overseas uh, in the last half of 2019 Um, we kind of had a holiday through Europe for a few months and that really cemented the idea that we just needed to to do it Give us an idea of, of what Anti will be and sort of what you've been um, building in regards to food and what the offering will be uh, yeah, sure. So, Anti is going to be a sake bar. Uh, we'll be offering a massive selection of sakis, some cocktails, some beers, uh, and we're going to try and not offer wine. Um, <laughs> see how that goes. <laughs> um, we just want to do something really different, uh, and I think it's something that Sydney hasn't really seen before. Um, we're so lucky that a lot of restaurants and things have have and are getting uh, into sake, but there is no real one place you can come and, and deep dive into it, uh, which we're, we're looking forward to doing. Um, we are also uh, bringing in Matt's extensive record collection. Um, so all the sound at the bar will be through uh, record, uh, which is going to be fun. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, silences as we're all too busy to flip them, but that's cool. <laughs> I don't mind that. Um, and then food-wise, uh, it's not going to be Japanese is the one uh, the one thing we kind of really want to put forward. Um, we don't really want to 
I mean, coming from a pin bone background, we don't like to pigeonhole ourselves into doing anything for a very long time. Um, so we, we just want to really showcase what an amazing product it is. Um, is there any discoveries in regards to food and sake that you've discovered with this approach? Um, yeah, we were doing uh, – one of the good things of lockdown is that we've had nights off uh, at home for a while now. So uh, we've just been – testing things uh, and drinking. I'm trying to learn as much about all the different sakis we're going to offer as I can. We call it sake school. Uh, and I was in sake, sake school the other day uh, and we were drinking this amazing sake uh, brewed by this crazy punk lady in uh, a small town of Ine in Japan and she makes this red rice sake and it goes deliciously with dark chocolate. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. Um, cause I've been lucky enough to get some of her kasu, which is like the sake lees. Yeah. So, which is what's left over, uh, after you press the rice. Uh, so I'm going to kind of put that with chocolate and see where it goes. Wow. I want to explore this a little further, but you've done so many incredible things and been part of so many different things. Where did it all start for you though? Where, where was the interest in food when you were young? Um, my family had a very big influence uh, on me deciding to go into the food industry. Um, my dad's dad uh, is fourth generation. He owned a seafood business at uh, the fish markets uh, and he had a massive wholesale business. Um, uh, my dad didn't quite want to follow through with it, so he started a chef's apprenticeship. Uh, so I got to hear all these amazing stories, um, of dad being a, you know, young chef in the seventies in Sydney. Um, uh, and then he went long story, but he ended up going back to work for my grandfather and they created this, um, small goods business out of my grandfather's backyard in the inner West in Sydney, uh, with all these little smoke houses that they'd built out of bricks and things in the backyard. Uh, and they'd smoke all this ocean, um, rainbow trouts and batarga and ducks and fish. And, um, they would on sell that to restaurants and things and dad would make patos and terrines and they'd kind of sell them around town. So I just, I was, I just thought all oh, this was amazing. Um, and as I got older into my teen, into my teens and I got to hear the kind of the fun stuff that, that dad was doing, it just, it's all I wanted to do. Do you remember the first time you stepped into a commercial kitchen as a chef and, and how you felt? Yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I started my apprenticeship halfway through uh, year 12 because my folks wouldn't let me leave school and I just didn't really have any interest. Um, so, I bought the good food guide and I sat there and I read through everything and I circled all the places that I thought sounded really cool. Uh, and then I would watch the paper and I'd watch for um, ads and then I'd go through and I'd, and I, so I ended up at the clock hotel in Surrey Hills um, when there was a restaurant upstairs there many years ago. Um, and it was amazing. I was so excited. I'm sure I was a total um, Gumby, but <laughs> I was so lucky of having a little bit of experience like, when as soon as I kind of told dad that, you know, this is it, I want to be a chef, he was like, okay, I'm going to teach you how to, you know, usually on carrots and brunoise and onion. And so I was just, I was just so excited to be in there and I just, yeah, never left. Do you have any stories of those times with your dad and sort of passing on that knowledge? Um, yeah, we have, I have this really great memory um, of being a kid sitting in my grandparents' backyard and he used to um, make his own bataga. Um, and I had no idea that it was as fancy as it is these days. Um, so we used to, um, we'd sit out in the backyard and he'd have them all out drying in the sun and on, um, on these racks made out of like fishing wire and uh, fly screen and stuff. And, um, we would sit there with a vegetable peeler, a loaf of tip top wonder white bread and margarine, and we would eat bataka sandwiches. And it wasn't until I actually got into restaurants that I was like, oh, I know this. <laughs> it's how much? <laughs> but, yeah. You spent a lot of time at Billy Kwong, which had that sort of very small open kitchen, but incredible alumni. Yeah. What was that like compared to the clock? Uh, it was completely different. I, um, I managed to get a job at 
um, Billy Kong through uh, Hamish Ingham's brother, who was working with me at the clock at the time. Um, and I needed a, I wanted to, a change. I wanted something, something different. Needed a job, and he was like, "Go see my brother up the road." Uh, and I did, and I was there for nearly five years. I was so lucky. I was there through so many amazing chefs, um, and so many of them that I went on to keep working with over the years. But uh, yeah, I was Hamish hey, Ingham was my head chef. Tom, Tom McCary was the sous. Matt Lindsay um, was chef. Nick Wong, James Parry. It was just insane. Yeah. And I was like 18, <laughs> but no, incredible, incredible. Take us back into that uh, kitchen and, and restaurant. Do you, do you have any memories that you can share of that period of time? Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I started at Billy Kwong. Uh, I was a second-year apprentice, um, and I worked with uh, Hamish for a bit, and then he moved on uh, to open Bar H. Uh, Tama left to do Berta, uh, and Matt Lindsay kind of took me under his wing and um, I'd come in and we'd be talking about something and I'd be like, oh, wow, I don't know how to do that. So um, he would just be like, well, come in, get your work done and I'll teach you. So we started getting in like whole lambs so I could learn to break down a lamb or uh, we started doing suckling pigs so I got to learn how to do that. And I remember coming in one day being like, I've never rolled pasta so for a very, very brief amount of time, Billy Kwong had a pasta dish on. <laughs> a, no- a noodle, I think we called it. But <laughs> Rolled through a pasta machine, though. So. But, yeah, I was so lucky. Um, and then I ended up my last two years at Billy Kwong, I ended up there as the Sioux, working under Matt, which was, yeah, amazing. What did you take from your, your time there? Um, I mean, I've taken a lot of friendships with me. I still talk to everyone um but I, what i took forward is that that's the type of kitchen i want to work in i want to and i you know would one day create try to create for myself is that i want to work with a small team of people and i want them to be my family and i just want to hang out with them all the time and i want to you know go out and drink with them after work and i want to hang out on their days off and you know eat family meal and just it's all about working with the with just really great lovely like-minded people You've worked in so many venues, um, Berta, Three Blue Ducks, Wine Library. What's been the real sort of key moments in those early times leading up to Pinbog? Well, I think <clears throat> leaving Billy Kong was a very big moment <laughs> um, for they'd been there for so long. But um, in, I guess, probably the last year of, of BK, um, Mike Eggett, came and, and he came from Oscillate and Sepia and he started working with us and we just kind of became best mates. Um, and I remember talking to him about working at Sepia and all these amazing restaurants and he um, he was really, he kind of really guided me into, um, you know, looking to maybe try something different, to learn some different skill sets and, and things like that. So I think he probably in – the early years of my cooking and then certainly into the Pinbone years, he was a massive influence. Tell us about Pinbone. <laughs> it's, it's hard to sort of, um, as you mentioned earlier, pigeonhole it. There's so many things happened with Pinbone, but where did the idea come from and how would you describe it to people? Um, Pinbone came from um, myself, Mike Eggett and his sister Bez, um, and we were, Mike and I were live, uh, working together, the three of us uh, and their younger brother were all living together in a share house um, and we were just having a really fun time um, and we were all kind of at a point uh, where we were working that we were looking for something different um, and this opportunity came up that we could um, have a little bit of a holiday and we kind of all stepped out of our busy lives for a couple of weeks and we're like wow this is this is it this is what we want to do you know we just we want to open a restaurant we want to do it together and we were young and crazy and we really thought we we had something that we wanted to to say and to show people and we were just so excited to be in the industry that we just wanted to be a part of it fully and do something ourselves and just cook our own food in our own kitchens and 
you know, play whatever music we wanted and wear whatever we wanted. And it was, yeah, it was madness. Um, <laughs> but it really worked. <laughs> Do you have any stories of that madness? There's been so many iterations of of, of Pinbone, but um, good luck, Pinbone, for instance, pulling that together in that sort of ramshackled um, former restaurant. Um, tell us about what, what that was like. That's so cool. I think that'll always be one of the, fam- the best places I've worked. Um, I just had so much fun doing it. Um, it was so much hard work and we were just in it. Um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we we rented this space on um, Anzac Parade in Kensington, major road in Sydney, uh, that was going to be demolished. So we got it for peanuts. Um, and it used to be a Japanese restaurant. Um, and so it kind of had this really kind of interesting vibe to it and us having no money or <laughs> any way of really doing anything fancy, um, we painted it hot pink and red and um, bought cheap black carpet from Bunnings and found stools um, which came from a school and tables that came from a church. Like we just, it was amazing. We, um, I think we spent about 20 grand and we just managed to pull this thing together right at the last minute by the skin of our teeth with both sets of parents building, painting, carpeting. <laughs> um, but it was amazing. Um, we had two walks uh, and we had this tiny little conro and we just pumped out a lot of food uh, for, yeah, and just crazy. <laughs> we had this stupid um, exhaust hood in um, in the kitchen and, it was quite temperamental, but we didn't really know it because it was just so hot in there all the time. You're standing over a walk, so you don't you get used to it pretty fast. Um, and there was myself and Mike and, and uh, our chef, Brando, that was working with us, and um, people kept coming in to have a chat and, from the dining room. They're like, God, it's hot in here. And we're like, oh, whatever. Um, and then all of a sudden we had a bottle of sesame oil in the kitchen and it exploded. And we were like, oh, shit, maybe it is hot in here. <laughs> Uh, it turned out the yeah exhaust wasn't working at all, but <laughs> but um, yeah it was insane. We yeah we just ran on adrenaline for the moment it opened to the moment we closed it. it was an incredible time. It became one of the most popular BYO restaurants in the city for its time. What, what sort of thing? What, what what were you cooking there? What, what what do you think the draw was for for all those people that sort of fought to get in? <laughs> I guess we had we had no rules. Um, if you wanted to bring in an esky with uh, bottles of you know slabs of beer and, and bottles of champagne and things, you could. Uh, if you wanted to bring in a bottle of gin and just kind of sit and have a little bit of a sad and sorry night, you could. Uh, and we charged you five dollars for it. So um, I think, and I, I guess we were. That's what we wanted to be doing, you know, and that's what we w- used to do uh, before opening is that us and a whole group of friends um, just used to hunt around Chinatown to find really delicious food that we could BYO wine to. Um, and for us, it just yeah made sense. There was a period of time where Pin- Pinbone teamed up with Maryvale to do Dirty Italian Disco. Well, what were the benefits and challenges of of combining this idea that the three of you had had with such a big group? Um, It completely changed our idea. We'd gone from, you know, yeah, opening things, paying for everything in cash and having no budget and um, (laughs) scrimping and saving and paying ourselves peanuts um, to actually going to a proper, (laughs) a proper, um, you know, team of people that, that just did things uh, and made things happen and we didn't have to carpet or paint anything, which was pretty crazy. Um, But we went from, well, I certainly went from working in a restaurant that would sit maximum 50 people to um, working in a a drive-through bottle shop that sat minimum of 100 (laughs) and did, you know, 300, 350 people in a night. It was just madness. It's a big learning curve really fast. (laughs) 
What's it been like for you as a chef switching cuisines? You've got um, Asian cuisine running threads through your food, but also um, Italian and, and contemporary Australian. Has it been easy for you to sort of sh- shift through those? Um, I wouldn't say easy, but uh, I kind of look for it too. I really like to keep changing things and learning things and um i like to kind of go down a rabbit hole and just be like i'm gonna learn all about this um but having such a great grounding in um my training and my time at billy kong it really teaches you not just about chinese cuisine but how how to learn and how to teach yourself and um how to adapt so coming, you know, going from Chinese uh, straight into super Italian um, food, it kind of makes so much sense because there's a lot of crossover and, um, you know, how you layer your flavors and how you build dishes is kind of similar. Um, it's just yeah, different different flavor combinations. You use anchovies instead of fish sauce and, you know, you use tomatoes instead of soy and you, you get that depth of flavor Um you just get to it in a different way, but the yeah the my, the training having um, training through Asian cuisines really early on just really opens your mind to how other cuisines work, and it all kind of slots in, and it all makes sense to me anyway. <laughs> You've worked uh, in numerous locations with Tama Kerry from Billy Kwong to Birder and Lankan Filling Station. Uh, what, what sort of influence has she had on, on your career? She's had a massive, massive influence. Um, I've worked with her oh, for years, all up now. Um, we we just kind of hit it off. She really um, kind of took me under my wing, her wing, when I was yeah eighteen, fresh faced at Billy Kwong, and just um, we kind of became really good friends, um, and we still are. I had dinner with her last night, <laughs> and I told her I was doing this, and I was like, you know. I feel like I'm going to get asked what your influence was on me. And um, I said, the, the one thing I really, <laughs> I was like, the one thing that pops to my mind straight away is that if there's anything going wrong, go and stand under the fan in the cool room. It fixes everything. <laughs> also, if you cut yourself, you should have a shot of vodka and eat some chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Tom has always had this amazing ability to um, bring bold flavours to the fore with a, with a bit of a delicate touch. What's it been like from a, a food perspective working from her as a chef? Uh, well, Tama has so much to teach you that like you can learn so, so much in how she, just how her brain works um, and how she thinks of things and just how she can take ingredients that you've used 10,000 times before and just completely turn it on its head. Um, and she has this just amazing knowledge of, I mean, Sri Lankan cuisine. Um, like through at Lankan Filling Station, we based a lot of things on her grandmother's recipes and to and her aunties and her aunties' friends and, you know, all these. We drew on so many stories that she has um, to be able to bring the food at Lincoln to the plate. And I think that's really what Tama does so well is that she has this incredible story and she's able to, to put it on the plate. The pandemic changed the lives of so many and so many people in the industry looked to other vocations to get money through the door. You spent some time with Feather and Bone. What sort of role did you have and what, what impact did it have on you? Um, well, I'd just come back from this big trip through Europe, um, not not thinking uh, for a second that I wouldn't be able to just walk into a kitchen and, and pick up a job. I'd never had <laughs> any problem before. Uh, and we got back just as, um, just as the pandemic hit. So I came back to lockdown. Um, and instantly you know, there isn't, there were no kitchens. Um, and I had no idea what I was going to do. And I was at a bit of a loss. And, um, I went in to, to buy my weekly meat from, from Grant and Laura at Feather and Bone. And two days later I had a job. <laughs> Um, it was, I'd never worked in a production side of things before. Um, so that was really different to anything I'd ever done. Um, but a really great chance. And cause I had the time, a really great chance to really learn how to do, 
a uh, whole lot of things like canning and preserving and, um, you know, big batch cooking and things like that. It's just something I had um, had never had the chance to do. But I think moving, moving out of there, um, I worked there through lockdown and then when uh, restaurants opened back up, I, I went back into working with restaurants. But just... I mean, to be able to work with the produce they, they have is incredible and the farmers that they work with and the produce that, you know, the whole carcasses that arrive in a truck and half an hour later um, someone's brought to you all these cuts of meat and they're like, what do you want to do with this? <laughs> Think quick, you've got 50 kilos of it. So <laughs> That sort of experience and insight, has that changed the way that you approach food in a, in a kitchen now? Definitely. Um, it's really changed the way that I look at I guess, especially meat, um, you know, having worked through through kitchens, I guess I was lucky in some of the kitchens I, I did work in, but to ring up and place an order through a, you know, a butchery um, and then the next day, you know, a bag of cryvacked chicken thighs turn up at your door, um, to having to having this amazing connection to, um, you know, the actual whole bird and the chicken and where it came from and who grew it and how it got to you and, you know, being championed by, by people like Grant and Laura, it was, it's completely changed the way I, I, um, I look at it and yeah, going, going forward into kitchens, I'm, I'm definitely going to take that, that side of things. But. Well, you've been building Anti now for, for a year and it, and it will open soon. What's it been like creating this um, this bar and concept? You've, you've um, opened places before with a limited budget and a um, tin of paint. But is, is, is this a little different? This is definitely different. Um, this kind of feels, it's, I don't think it's the right way to say it, but it feels like a grown-up restaurant. <laughs> It feels like I'm finally, <laughs> finally a grown up. Maybe <laughs> Matt, Matt's a grown up. <laughs> um, but yeah, to this will the first restaurant that will um, be my own that I've opened. That's that I don't plan on closing within a couple of months. <laughs> I guess with all the pin bones, we never really knew what was going to work and what wasn't, and uh, so we never ever went into any of the ventures we did with an ideal that it was going to last for more than a few months. Uh, so to be looking at to opening a space uh, and building it from from the ground up, there was you know we've done everything here. We've put grease traps and hoods and complete kitchens and whole dining rooms um, with the idea that this is this is a long term. This is my you know this is the next stage in in my career. This is my restaurant that I'm going to have hopefully for a long time. Uh, is really. Yeah, it's a mind <laughs> boggling sometimes. Given the the last year and a half and the impact on the industry, what sort of impact has it had on you? And uh, does it affect the way that you're um, creating the operations and what offering you'll do? It has. Um, I had an interesting view of the pandemic uh, in the last year and a half, um, seeing it through. Um, not just through kitchens, but seeing it on the the importing side through through Matt, and just um, you know his, his business kind of just stopped overnight, <laughs> um, and watching that and watching the impact that that had, I mean, on everybody, but on the producers uh, back in Japan, I guess they were having it just as tough a time, if not more so than than us uh, and just listening to them not being able to sell the amazing products that they have and not being able to um, carry on with production because of, uh, you know, they, staff couldn't get to them or um, they just don't have the space because these, you know, the producers we're working with are tiny family run operations. And if your tank's full of sake and you haven't sold it, we well, can't make another one. <laughs> You've got one tank. Um but just yeah, it really pushed us forward to be like we, we we want to support these people. These people are our friends, um, and we want to get the word out. And you know, just we want to help them <laughs> as much as we can. And uh, and it really became obvious over the last year and a half that you know the the best way for for us to uh, being able to keep being 
sorry, to be able to keep enjoying all these beautiful sakis is that we should just start doing it ourselves. <laughs> we should just open it up and get as many people in drinking these amazing things as possible. You're not one to seek the limelight, but you've influenced so many diners in Sydney that have experienced um, your culinary offering. What is it that you love about what you do? I just really love being in the kitchen. I love cooking and I love feeding people and I love forming friendships with the chefs that I work with. Um, And I just like being in there and I like cooking. And I... um, you know, I guess I've really brought that forward to what we're doing now at Anti. It's going to be a completely open space. Um, so there is no – the kitchen's completely open. Uh, it's just one warping great slab of wood and I'm on one side and the diner's on the other. Um, so there's no hiding dirty chucks and things, but I'll deal with that when we get to it. Um, but it's just being able to – in like being able to interact with the customers um, – is what I'm really looking forward to um, and being able to to talk to people and just be like, this is how I'm doing this and it's delicious, you should eat some. <laughs> It'll go well with that, you know, and um, I just really like having the connection to the customers and, and to, my, to the people I work with. But, um, yeah, I guess that's what keeps me <laughs> doing it every day. Or well, as Auntie opens up, um, what are you most looking forward to? Oh, what am I most looking forward to? Uh, I don't know. Let me think. <laughs> um, I'm most looking forward to seeing a whole lot of uh, regulars that um, I get lots of text messages from asking me every week when we're going to open. <laughs> uh, I'm really looking forward to to Matt getting back out on the floor because um, the – I mean, he's – He's so great. Um, <laughs> I'm biased. Um, but just, you know, have having been served by him uh, and watching him work in, you know, many different restaurants over the years, um, he just has this incredible story to tell. Um, and I'm looking really forward to him being able to, to do that. Um, and I think he'll do that through the records he chooses. <laughs> Uh, and the sake pours, and I'm just really excited that I get to do it with him. Well, Gemma, I know there's a lot of people that are really excited to see what you do as well. We've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds to hear your story today. Please keep in touch. Good luck, and uh, we'll catch up again soon. (laughs) Thank you very much. You'll have to come in when you're up again. I would love that. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Thanks, Hug. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.